Dear brothers and sisters, I wish to welcome you to the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today, we continue to read from the Sermon on the Mount. Today, Jesus continues to lecture us on what we should do as his followers. You can call this lecture on Christian ethics or lecture on Christian morality. Discipleship is a relationship, and for us to really become faithful disciples, we have to live like Christ. We have to live a Christ-like life. We have to live a Christocentric life. So Jesus is teaching us the way we should live this life. And that's what this Sermon on the Mount is about. Trying to, you know, open up the minds of his followers to understand that their vocation, our vocation, is a vocation to a new way of life, a new way of seeing things, a new perspective, a new orientation, a new ideology, a new way of doing things, a new way of saying things, a new worldview, a worldview that has Jesus as its center. Today, before I get into the proper reflection, <laughs> Let me remind us of the reason why God gave the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. If you look at the first reading, it speaks about choice and the implications and consequences of the choices that we make. In the Gospel also, you see that Jesus is re-enacting because he said, I did not come to abolish the law, rather I have come to fulfill the law. We shall come to that. So it is about law, it is about us, and how this law should guide us in living our lives. Let me get back to what I said before. What is the spirit and why did God give the Decalogue or the law? When the Jewish people talk about law, they are talking about the Decalogue. They are talking about the Ten Commandments. Deca means ten. They are talking about the prophets. They are talking about the Pentateuch. They are talking about the written law, not the oral law. The oral law can be ascribed to the scribes. And you know the scribes arose in the 4th and the 5th century BC. But we are talking about the divine law, the eternal law that God gave. And that's why Jesus rightly said that nothing can thwart this law of the Lord. Nothing can change it. It is eternal because... These words were spoken by God. God personally wrote this decalogue and gave to Moses. He gave Moses two tablets. I'm sure you remember that. Let's go back again, as I said. Let's talk about why did God give those uh, commandments. God gave the commandments to foster relationship with his people and among his people. God gave the Ten Commandments not to police us, not to check on us, not to monitor us, but God gave the Ten Commandments basically to foster reverence and respect. Reverence, that is, vertical relationship, the relationship between humanity and divinity. And that's why when you look at the Ten Commandments, you will notice that number one, number two, number three, they speak about our reverence to God. If you look at from number four to number ten, they speak to us about interpersonal relationship, and that is what we call respect. So, Having established this, let us also remember once again that the law was given for relationship, for relationship to foster a genuine relationship among the people of God and with God. I'm making emphasis on this because if we understand that the law was given just about for the sake of relationship, you will understand also why Jesus is teaching about this. In the gospel today because as i said discipleship is a relationship and jesus wanted those who became his followers to have and to live a life that fulfills that original objective that original aim of god in giving the ten commandments 
So Jesus did not come to abolish the law. Rather, he has come to fulfill the law. He has come to teach us the real meaning of the law. And how did Jesus teach us and how did he fulfill the meaning of the law? On that cross. Because on the cross, Jesus gave the highest expression of love. Because the whole thing about the Ten Commandments, the whole thing about the law of the Lord is about love. Without love, there's nothing like relationship. Relationships are made possible because of love. And that's why Jesus would demonstrate to us the fulfillment of this law on the cross. In the same way, Jesus wants our relationship to be influenced by L-O-V-E. Jesus wants us to build our relationships on love. And that's why you're going to look at the things that Jesus mentioned in this passage, in the gospel passage today. So remember that everyone is capable of loving. There's no human being who is incapable of loving. You know why? Because we were all created in the image and likeness of God. And the first letter of St. John chapter 4 tells us that God is love. So God is love and he made us in his own image and likeness, which simply means through common sense that we are images of love. It means that we have the inherent power, capability to love and to be loved. But we have also the choice either to hate or to love. Remember that God created us and gave us rationality. He gave us free will. And free will is also, you know, a manifestation of rationality. Free will is the function of our rationality. It is because we are rational, that's why we are free. And because we are free, that's why we are responsible for every choice and every action that we take. So you can choose to love, you can choose to hate. But if you want to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, we have to make the choice of loving. Before Jesus started talking about the things he wants us to do in a better, different, unique way, he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not get into the kingdom and the kingdom will not get into you. Let us also establish this. The kingdom of God is the presence of God. It means that the way we live our lives will determine whether we will have this presence in us. If we live a life of love, because at this moment, the scribes and the Pharisees were not living that life of love, but they were being judgmental, they were being imposing, they imposed everything on the people. And Jesus did not like that. So if we live a life of love, automatically the presence of God will be in us because God is love. We see the same thing in the first reading from the book of Sirach, where the Bible says that if we choose the good, we will be saved. What is salvation? To be saved. Salvation is that ultimate embrace, that ultimate union, that ultimate fellowship and communion between humanity and divinity. So when we keep the commandments of God, which is to love one another, when we love one another, God dwells in us. The presence of God is made manifest in us. Let's take this one by one. The first thing that Jesus spoke about here is about anger. Let me say this clearly. Getting angry is not the problem because anger is, by the way, a human passion. But the problem is what we think about when we get angry, what we say when we get angry, what we do when we get angry. Are we able to control ourselves? It's all about being you know, careful about the things we say because we are going to say poisonous things. We are going to say things that are going to hurt people. You see, when we speak bad words, we, we who, who say those words, we may forget them. But the, those that we spoke the words to, they will never forget those words. And that's why it's always very good to be careful the things we say. Don't say any word when you are so angry. Don't say any word when you are so excited. Because if those words will be replayed for you, you'll be surprised you actually said those things. 
So anger is a human passion, and we should learn how to, you know, transform our anger into something positive, not something destructive. Again, Jesus spoke about reconciliation. If you are bringing a gift to the altar and you remember that you have said bad words to your, your brother or your sister, or your sister or your brother have said something bad to you, and you guys are in enmity, drop your gifts. Go and reconcile. Which means that as Christians, we should take the first step you know, in the process of reconciliation. Do not wait for the one who hurt you or the one you hurt to be the first to come to you. The person may have some obstacles and hindrances or impediments why he or she cannot get to you. But as a Christian, we should be courageous enough, open-minded, in order to take the first step in the process of reconciliation. The second thing that Jesus spoke about here is adultery. And this also should involve premarital sex and fornication and all those. You know, he says to us, if your eye is going to cause you to sin, you better you remove it. If your hand, better you cut it off. Of course, this is not a literal cutting off, but it's about keeping them in check. It's about being conscious of your emotions and passions. It's about you being in total control of your senses. Unfortunately, today, there are so many young people who lead other people into temptation. And I want to use this opportunity to beg our young ladies, please stop exposing your sensitive body parts. Stop leading the men into sin. Many young men today are always engaged in masturbation because they go out, they see sexy looking girls, they cannot control themselves. Come on, this society belongs to each and every one of us and we have to respect the sight of other people. Stop being naked. Stop dressing in nudity. Respect us. And the same thing I also say to the men. Be careful. Respect yourselves also. It's not good for you to open up yourself and you think that you are so handsome. No. We have to respect ourselves. And I have to make this distinction here. There's a difference between looking and seeing. You can see something accidentally. You're scrolling your phone, something pops up. You can see that. It could be a dirty picture. That's a difference. When you look, look means that you saw that. It popped up in your cell phone. Then you click on it or you came back. Then you scroll. Then you open it. That is looking. It means you are deliberately or intentionally trying to find out more. That is where you begin to commit the sin. Number three, Jesus talked about divorce. Of course, we know that as a church, we don't accept divorce. If you listen carefully to what Jesus said, he actually said, unless the marriage is unlawful, which means that divorce is not permissible. That's why in the Catholic Church, we don't divorce. We can only annul a marriage based on the fact that the marriage ab initio did not exist or the marriage ab initio from the beginning did not fulfill the grounds for validity. So divorce is never an option. It's not part of our life because it's a destruction of love, destruction of relationship and destruction of family. The final one is about falsehood. Jesus encourages us today to be sincere. Let our yes be our yes. Let our no be our no. We should stop living a life of deception, a complicated life. As Christians, as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, we must learn to be sincere. Honesty is the best policy. Stop lying. Stop lying to your husband. Stop lying to your wife. Stop lying to your friends. Stop lying to everyone. Take the responsibility of saying the truth. The second reading today reminds us that if we really obey the law of the Lord, that a lot of good things are waiting for us. God will reward every one of us who lived according to the dictates of his commandments. So you are not losing anything by keeping the commandments of God because happiness is awaiting you. In fact, the happiness begins from here. When you live according to the commandments of God, when you reverence God, respect yourself and respect the people around you, it brings a lot of joy and happiness to you. Thank you.
for listening. Please do well to share this video. I wish you a happy Sunday. God bless you.